very much, and we're going to go into um, our second panel. Uh, ever since people started talking about crowdfunding, uh, avoiding fraud has become one of the constant topics. And commentators' uh, reactions have ranged from there's no fraud in donation crowdfunding, um, or um, there's no fraud in European crowdfunding, of course, Europe's the right? Um, to, oh my God, you've just brought back boiler rooms. Um, as Brian said on the former panel, um, fraud, even if it's a very, very small amount, is going to have a disproportionate effect on how this stuff works. The first couple of cases of something going really wrong and uh, 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 Nigerian princes who just invented cold fusion in their sinks, the first time that happens, there's going to be a disproportionate reaction among possibly the regulators, certainly among the, uh, the commentariat, and it's going to hurt crowdfunding. So the way we see it, there's a lot of different to prevent fraud. Uh, and all of these elements have to work together. You've got to have the regulators, you've got to have the self-regulatory organizations, you've got to have accreditation programs, due diligence providers, whether mechanized or, um, or, or like crowd check or sort of more subjective, and of course the crowd itself. So this panel is going to discuss several different ways of looking at fraud prevention and how we might get the right balance between investor protection and small business growth. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Brian Appel, who's from uh, the office of uh, Senator Michael Bennett, who of course was hugely instrumental in getting all of this crowdfunding uh, legislation through. And I've had the pleasure of talking to him several times. Uh, Lauren Oppenheimer, who's a senior policy advisor from uh, Third Way. Uh, and Douglas Alanoff, who is the founding partner of Alanoff, Grossman, and Skelt <coughs> Sure. sure. Um, and who's been very, uh, very active uh, in the crowdfunding space. So I'm going to ask each of them to just say a few words and uh, then we'll have uh, a bit of a discussion and open it up to questions. So uh, Lauren, would you mind uh, just saying a few things? Sure. Hi, my name is Lauren Oppenheimer. I'm here with Third Way. Uh, Sandra Think Tank created about seven years ago. Uh, we advocate private sector economic growth and a, a strong middle class. Um, after the financial crisis, it became very clear that a, l a number of policymakers really needed a lot of help in the arena of what our capital no. markets. No, obviously not. <laughs> not my colleague on the panel here, but um, for a, um, as a former recovering Capitol Hill staffer, it was clear that some of my, um, you know, my junior colleagues whose members weren't on the committee was um, in need of a little help on the capital markets arena. So a year ago, I helped launch the Capital Markets Initiative, which is. Um, what I'm doing at Third Way now. Um, as we all know, the president signed the Jobs Act into law um, to make it easier for startups and small businesses to access capital. Um, and there's a, a lot of risk in these new types of, of companies. And startups often fail, small businesses go bust, and investors lose money. Um, and we all know this. But funding for these companies usually comes through traditional means like banks or friends and family. Um, but sometimes neither are willing to invest, and so this is where clearly crowdfunding comes in. Um, and when Third Way heard about crowdfunding, we were really excited. We thought this was a really innovative way for small businesses to access credit, but we wanted to make sure that there were the necessary safeguards set up to protect investors. So today I'm gonna to talk about, really quickly, uh, three things, transparency, educating investors, um, and enforcement. So, one of the reasons why American capital markets are, are, are so fantastic is that they are the most open, fair, and transparent in the world. And uh, I recently was talking with a professor at Wharton, his name is David Wessels, and he was really um, explaining that because of the transparency and disclosures that we have um, currently, that's what makes our capital markets the best. Um, so, you know, that kind of leads us to crowdfunding. And if crowdfunding, and I think, you know, just to echo kind of what Sean Green was saying, if crowdfunding is going to be successful for this economy, it must, be, it has to promote transparency and protect investors. So one of the things that I think was great that Senator Michael Bennett um, included was making sure that crowdfunding intermediaries register with the SEC. Um, and Tim Rao, the founder and CEO of Cambridge Innovation Center um, up in Mass, says that, um, Intermediaries are the key to eliminating fraud, and I, I completely agree with him. I think that they're going to play a really important role. And um, you 
of to echo the, what you were saying earlier about the about Europe. There is this example in England called Crowd Cube, I'm not sure. um, which is a British firm and one of the world's first crowdfunding website for equity investments, and um, they thoroughly their vet, vet their companies that are listed with, and they've um, they have a 75% rejection rate of companies who listed. Um, who, sorry, who submitted applications that were listed and then that those were rejected. Um, so I think Crowdcube's early success in the UK shows that the SEC, that SEC registered intermediaries in the US could be helpful, if not instrumental, in com combating fraud. And it was funny because an early the first panel also mentioned eBay. And that, I think, is a great example for folks who kind of don't really understand what the in intermediary role would be. And uh, for instance, I, I bought a purse on eBay and it was a design purse and I'm was sure it was fake. So there was a number of procedures set in place that I could go through eBay and I was able to resolve the situation to my uh, my pleasure. So that, I think that that is, you know, similarly is gonna play a great role. Um, the other thing I want to quickly touch on is educating investors. Um, I think when people talk about fraud, <coughs> the, the concern for crowdfunding is the relaxing of securities laws. Um, and so while by no means are securities laws perfect, as we've all experienced the past uh, recent few years. Um, a lot of them are in place because of previous episodes of securities fraud. Um, crowdfunding allows startups and small businesses, typically the riskiest investment opportunities, to solicit any investor on the internet to buy stock in the firm without having any, without having to make the financial disclosures that are currently required for firms that engage in public offerings. So it doesn't really take an expert to say that there's real possibilities for um, for fraud here. But, um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that for the most part Americans, well, half of them are investing <coughs> in the stock market, there's a lot that they need to know, learn and know about stocks and bonds. And this is something I think that, you know, policymakers discuss often is financial education, but I just think that that's something to keep in mind um, as we go through the finalizing of the rules with the SEC, but um, there's a real difference when people donate to a good cause or a campaign or my brother's band, like I, I hope they make it, but um, you know, there's a difference between investors putting in money into a company and hoping to get a return, so um, I, I just think that's important for, for folks to realize. Um, so, I mean, that may be obvious, but you know, there is a difference between investing in a blue chip like IBM and um, these, these companies that are just starting out. Lastly, I'm just gonna really touch quickly on enforcement. Um, in order, uh, I think the SEC should make the, uh, make sure that there are proper checks on the operation of crowdfunding intermediaries, that there is sufficient transparency and disclosure and investors are aware of the risks involved in their investments. Um, the SEC will need to make sure that rules for crowdfunding are written clearly, that they're revisited in the future or else these, this new investment vehicle will quickly become suspect. Um, and I'm just going to quickly close with some of these, an interesting bunch of stats um, about the SEC. So currently they're responsible for overseeing 35,000 entities, including, uh, sorry, did I say 35? I'm going too fast, sorry. 35,000 entities, 11,800 investment advisors, 9,500 uh, public companies, 4,200 mutual funds, 5,400 broker dealers with 175,000 branch offices. So, um, you know, the, and the SEC's budget for FY11 was 1.3 billion. That's 12 examiners for every one trillion dollars under management. Um, so, I don't know if that sounds like enough resources to you, but I think it's clear that they have a, a very limited budget to uh, work with, and they've already got a pretty full plate. In addition to dealing with the aftermath of the financial crisis, so just wrapping up the enforcement, I think it's really important that they work with the state securities regulators um, hand in hand, because there's, you know, there could be a lot to, a fraud to look out for. Um, to sum up, I'm just gonna agree with um, the SBA Associate Administrator, Sean Green. I think it's really important to ensure that widespread fraud doesn't occur, because if investors lose, lose face, <coughs> faith in the crowdfunding marketplace, they're unle unlikely to return to it anytime soon. So. Uh, you know, in closing, crowdfunding is a really innovative way for small businesses to access capital, and we need to keep uh, those three things in mind, transparency, the importance of educating investors, and proper enforcement. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Sure, sure. Um, my name again.
again, it's Brian of Hell, and I work for Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado. And we got interested in crowdfunding um, basically because ever since Senator Bennett was appointed to the Senate in 2009, um, you know, getting appointed in the midst of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, access to capital is something he hears in every community in Colorado, um, whether it's in a large city, small towns, especially rural communities. So he got interested in it as looking at crowdfunding as a unique and kind of new way for investor to you know, allow small businesses to have more access to capital. Um, and then we just have a great startup community in Colorado, and we're blessed with that. And so it was kind of that confluence of factors that we started working with Senator Brown um, and uh, Senator Merkley on trying to get a compromised piece of legislation out of the Senate, which um, for those who watch the Senate is sometimes difficult. Um, so, and I don't want to go into too much detail of the sausage making, but I wanted, I guess, um, Sarah asked to provide a little bit of perspective of how we got the piece of legislation that we ultimately passed. Um, and I would just say the overriding goal when we we're trying to write it is trying to create an environment that where crowdfunding would flourish, but where crowdfunding would also be sustainable and where investors have confidence. And I, I, I mean, I've told Sarah this a bunch of times, as we were writing it, we were, you know, we're like, we're either going to squash it by putting this thing in here, or if we take it out, it's going to turn into the Wild West. And trying to find that right balance was a real challenge. Adding to it, typically when Washington legislates, this is a town where there's an interest group for everything. And when I say everything, there's everything. And there's typically when people write bills, they will send a draft of it to an interest group and they'll have their general counsel look at it and say, does this work, does this not work? Um, part of the, one of the more interesting and, and actually fun but challenging things about crowdfunding is that equity-based crowdfunding largely doesn't exist in the United States. There was no, there is now, but there was no U.S. Association of Crowdfunders. Or, so we actually really had to kind of go out and find people who did things like crowdfunding or had an interest in crowdfunding. And that was talking to you know, people like Dana Moriello from ProFounder, um, Naval Ravikant from AngelList, Sarah Hanks. Um, so, and then we were also talking to investor protection groups as we were trying to get it. And again, as we were working on it, it was something that was sustainable, that would be sustainable, that had sufficient investor protections and would allow crowdfunding to flourish, but also could pass the United States Senate, um, which again, seems easy now, but was not easy at the time, um, and at a time when it is really difficult to pass anything in the Senate. Um, just to kind of, and I'll keep my remarks brief so we have time for questions, but the most difficult issues we struggled with um, and Lauren mentioned this a little bit, with state preemption um, or the relationships between state regulators and federal regulators and exactly what she said before, the SEC having, you know, it, it was a very compelling argument that the SEC doesn't have the resources to look at $50,000 offerings occurring, you know, in Denver, Colorado. Um, but at the same time, trying to avoid having a patchwork of regulations um, between every state, and particularly something that's internet-based, having patchworks of regulations, different capital requirements, different bookkeeping records. So trying to find that balance, and that's kind of how I think we got to the place in our legislation where we preserve state examination and enforcement authority, but then we created investor limits. We created an enormous amount of, a large amount of disclosures for issuers about you know their business plan, their financial condition. Um, you know, uh, making sure that we can minimize conflicts of interest, that someone posting about how great a company is, making sure that they're not also being paid by the company to post that. So it was this really fun but also strange balancing of interests and a little bit where, you know, we were kind of learning as we go along with this. Um, because I, you know, I think it's fair to say there are no experts on equity-based crowdfunding yet. Um, Sarah may be getting there. And, um, you know, <laughs> She's working on it, but, and I think the, you know, and Sarah, even at one point when we were talking about the legislation, um, in the statute, there's points where it says, you know, the SEC may prescribe other rules as necessary to further the interest protection of investors, and, you know, we went back and forth a little bit on that, you know, because clearly we don't want the SEC to turn this into flat-out broker-dealer registration, because what was the point of doing this in the first place? We created funding portal registration for a separate reason, but at the same time, we put those sentences in there for the things that we weren't potentially thinking of when we were crafting the legislation. So that's kind of a little bit of a give and take that we had in putting it together. 
you know, and so we had there were political challenges as well. I mean, the investor protection community is still very suspect about some aspects of crowdfunding, and you know, we're going to have to make sure that this thing. And I think it, it's as much as an investor protection issue, and also it's important for crowdfunding and a sustainability issue that if you have somebody out there, you know, the, what Sarah was saying, the Nigerian princes, um, you know, it, it's going to sully people who are trying to do the right thing, make sure that, you know, their investors have adequate information, making sure that their issuers are legitimate companies. Um, so, you know, it was a real challenge trying to get the investor protection community some level of comfort in preparing this, which was important to getting Democratic support for the proposal in the U.S. Senate. Um, you know, I remember one of our first hearings, Professor John Coffey testified, you know, an, an earlier version, not to disparage anyone's versions, but he called it, you know, the Boiler Room Protection Act, and he had this vision of somebody looking like Danny DeVito showing up at a bar and inventing a company, and, you know, so it was trying to address those concerns, but also having a product that actually the thing can work, in which we hope it, it will flourish. And, you know, in the end, there was some sense of indication here you know, our amendment passed the Senate on a 64 to 35 vote, and we had support from funding platforms who realized long-term long -term sustainability was incredibly important, but we also had support from consumer groups. So it's something that, you know, my boss, I remember, was, like, really excited by because, you know, he's only been in this town for three and a half years, and, you know, typically people fall upon these lines pretty quickly, and being able to get some degree of consensus, even though if not everybody was happy with every aspect of it, um, it was kind of a, a neat experience, something that I hadn't even experienced much. So anyway, I will, uh, I will end it and uh, happy to. Thanks, thanks, Brian. And I do want to say that we look forward to having legitimate Nigerian business. <laughs> <laughs> Let me to, to yeah. uh, single them out. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Doug Yelanoff. My hat's off to you and your efforts. Uh, I think the balancing of uh, considerations here actually is reflected in the remarkable because the propensity not to do anything when there's a looming potential negative out there is really very compelling for people to just have inertia. Uh, our law firm's been in business for 20 years. We're 60 lawyers. We have 35 securities lawyers. We cater to a variety of different controversial securities programs or what are perceived to be controversial securities programs over the last 20 years that are inherently innocuous, but in the hands of good people, they're great in the hands of bad people. No doubt they could be problematic, and they have roots that go back 30 years. The regulators have struggled with them. We as a firm, and I have a couple partners in the room, have worked very closely with the SEC, the exchanges, um, and various regulatory authorities to make them better and improve them over time. Nothing comes out of the gate is perfect. It will be evolutionary. Uh, but I think the basic framework would have, for what is there is actually quite compelling, timely, and actually inevitable because it will happen worldwide whether or not it happens here. It is happening worldwide. So honestly, uh, it's tremendous what you guys have accomplished. We've been monitoring it for a year. Uh, we chose not to get involved in the, in the process down in D.C., but to monitor it from afar. We planted our flag very quickly after the, uh, the law was passed. And we are very involved with uh, the National Crowdfunding Association in front of the SEC to make sure that the rules and regulations don't burden the program to the point where it just can't practically uh, happen, where uh, the deals can't be facilitated, which gets back to the very real issue on investor protection, in, uh, avoiding fraud, which we deal with every day. We work on hundreds of financings uh, or have in a variety of different programs, and it, I think part of it has to do with how you define fraud. Going out of business because your business model didn't work is not fraud. I'm sorry. There were dozens of dot-com companies that came into existence and died within a year, and they were not fraudulent. They just didn't work. Uh, fraud, it, for the purposes of this discussion, may be uh, interpreted to be that there are inconsistencies in the documentation that are provided to investors on the portals. That's not fraud in this context. It, fraud is stealing somebody's money and not putting it to work the way you said you were going to. So until the distinctions are made and uh, are clear, I think that the word fraud is bandied about in inappropriate ways that will continue to bog down capital formation, particularly for 
legitimate, earnest entrepreneurs who really don't have any bad intentions whatsoever. It's not that I'm not, not, not mindful that it could happen and it probably will happen, but I will say, and I've lived long enough, that Revco happened on the heels of Sarbanes-Oxley. Don't kid yourself. It's out there and it's going to happen, but the people I've spoken to are really earnest, genuine, legitimate professionals trying to accomplish some, something new and different and we need to support them. And so that's my from the soapbox. I think it's fantastic. I think it's got it. the fact that it's John Coffey uh, did have his point of view, which is a fair point of view, but it did get the portals are going to be regulated by the SEC and in all likelihood FINRA as well. If they end up treating portals that will be the gatekeepers here, uh, like registered broker dealers, and we do a lot of uh, registered broker dealer compliance, new membership applications then this thing's not getting off the ground. It's got to be treated as new and different and enlightened due diligence and enlightened investor protection has to be the thought process because if it's doing due diligence the way our firm does due diligence, we're not going anywhere. When we do an IPO due diligence, trust me, we spend a tremendous amount of time reading every organic document, interviewing every manager and making sure that what ends up going into the registration statement is letter perfect. And let's admit, sometimes that's not even the case. But it's it's largely consistent. That is not going to happen here, and it cannot happen. It's got to be with the enlightened work that uh, CrowdCheck is going to do to make sure that bad people don't raise money and then uh, take it from, from individuals. I think there's a great example on Kickstarter last week where $5,000 was raised, it got through the system, and then the crowd outed the party involved, and the money never actually got out of the PayPal accounts or whatever was holding the money, and it never, and so it never got funded. The crowd is loud, it will be heard, and if people aren't responsible, like in eBay, and I hope you have an authentic pocketbook, then uh, they won't have an opportunity to go back to the well again and raise money. And that's what happens offline in the VC community. People have a network of relationships where they vet people, and the crowd will help prevent a lot of that. It will happen, uh, but I, and it did happen uh, in this one example, and it's the story there is that it, it was caught quickly, more sooner than regulators might have done. So uh, that's my from the mountain top point of view. That's a great example, actually, Doug. Um, one question that I have is uh, staying on the whole crowd theme. How do we filter for the noise from the crowd? The crowd is incredibly important. The crowd will out people, in some cases, very fast if it's something they know, in other places uh, slower. But the crowd's got the crazy people in it. It's got the people who want to say, it's all Obama's fault, or it's not Obama's fault, or it would all be totally different if we just made raspberry ripple ice cream instead of pebble watches. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there, as well as the useful stuff. How do we filter that? Like, how do the portals filter that? Uh, it's going to be difficult. I mean, there's the, the answer without much detail. Uh, you go on Yahoo Finance, when you look at people who are commenting on the stocks that are in the public market, it's mm -hmm. very tough to see what people's agendas are. Uh, I, I love the example you gave of the, the, the uh, in your community, you need a, uh, a cleaners. Uh, I think it's going to be, you have to understand where the information is coming from. And if you recognize that there's a need for a, uh, a cleaners in your neighborhood and you want it, you're going to put up money. Your motivation is not IRR driven necessarily. Uh, so what's going to happen online is going to be some of what happens offline. You're going to have to know. I'm a Rick, sorry, I'm a New York Ranger fan. I know that a lot of captains can draw in room. I apologize in advance. That's why my voice is not as strong as it was. <laughs> uh, is you have to know who's writing the last post. So when somebody screams that there was a penalty, that person probably the person who always screams that there's a penalty without any filter. So education, actively taking responsibility as an investor for your portfolio and how you're going to invest is mission critical here. And it's not only the democratization of capitalism, as Sean pointed out, it's the democratization of responsibility in relatively small dollars. So the education component is going to be everything. And I can't wait to see what the portals do in that regard. Uh, one of the things that I think would be outstanding 
just like you're all sitting here assessing the validity of our positions based upon how we present ourselves, I think there ought to be a video clip for everybody who's trying to raise money. Just like in the courtroom, people like to see who they're assessing. And I think that that's something that's never been done except uh, in, in the in the offline world, and that's something that can help in the process. One, one thing that occurs to me is that um, one way to filter the craziness of the crowd is to require real person, real identities, as on Facebook, so you've got some chance of at least evaluating not just the entrepreneur, but the craziness or non-craziness of the commentator. Uh, and yet there's this tension between the not being able to advertise on social media. So I, I wonder if anyone's got any thoughts on how we can use social media to temper the input from the crowd. If we throw that all on Facebook, is that a terrible thing? And maybe Brian has some thoughts? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a combination of the views of the crowd, but also you have to realize, like, have to look at some of the fundamentals that are out there in the business uh, of the business plan, its financial financial condition. Is this something that actually sounds credible just because all these people are saying this amazing thing about it? Um, so it is, it, and I think the platforms have this really important role to make sure some of this information is presented in a manner that's relatable to someone who's investing five hundred dollars in you know a bakery down the street or a star or a startup across the country. Um, so I just think it has to be that confluence of factors there and knowing, you know, like, I guess, I mean, I fall victim to it when I'm looking at Yelp ratings right now and I'm like, oh God, this place has to be good. But, you know, part of it is, you know, it's, it's trying to find that balance there. But I think some of it is an incredibly important role for the portals for putting information out there that is credible and relatable to, um, mainstream investors and being able to kind of synthesize that with some of the discussion that's coming out through social media as part of the crowds. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that there needs to be something a little less complex with all the documentation that goes along with an IPO, but maybe look at like a Groupon or a Living Social, and, and they do have the fine print, but it's not written in, in a, a fashion of like a legalese that uh, I think a common investor, and I should say average investor, who's not an accredited investor will really understand and really be able to process. I mean, I don't necessarily think that they're, they're that translatable, but you know, if you're spending, I don't know, $50 to buy three baseball tickets and a hat and a t-shirt, you know, you, there's the little fine print that says, well, it has to be done by this date and you can't bring your sister. I, you know, I think that, that, but I think that those, in addition to the people, the Yelp style of feedback, that the, the fine print is I'd like to turn the conversation now to the portals themselves because there's been a lot of focus on <coughs> the, the fraudsters who are posing as entrepreneurs. There's going to be fraudsters posing as portals. They're going to take the, uh, the guys who are out in Bulgaria, I think, who just seem to be writing a lot of the software for this, and just throw in a bunch of fake companies, and it's going to look like it comes from Baltimore. Um, one of the uh, uh, initiatives in the industry that I'd like to mention is the, uh, the CAPS program, the accreditation program uh, that uh, crowdsourcing.org is behind. Um, that seems like one of the elements. I'm hoping also that, crowds, that uh, CrowdCheck will also be an element. But do you see anything uh, that's absolutely essential in some form of accreditation program for the portals? Uh, we'll start at this end and go that way. Lauren? You know, a lot of the examples that are used are like the gluten-free bakery or the dry cleaner or maybe the restaurant. And I think that there's a real difference between the restaurant in Bethesda versus the restaurant in Omaha, Nebraska. So perhaps, and this might sound really trivial, but perhaps as a part of the due diligence, someone might actually have to go to the location and actually make sure that it is in a boiler room. That there are maybe two people, you know, actually in Ithaca at the bakery baking those things from the ground up. Um, so, you know, that's just something I, I think could be a part of the due diligence. So that's something we're planning to do next time. <laughs> oh, good. Brian? We're excited about the trip to Ithaca. Um, <laughs> you know, in terms of portals, I, you know, in terms of making sure we have legitimate portals, I mean, I think that was something we tried, you know, in, in having SEC registration and SEC oversight for the actual portals. 
At least these guys won't register. They'll just throw up. So, and be pop up. so that's the threshold thing. If it's not registered, you know there's a problem from yeah. the get go. I mean, I think you know. Granted, who you know is it? The state securities <coughs> enforcement regulator? Is it um, who may be selling into a particular state? Is it whatever SRO comes up? Um, but as an initial glance, it will be very easy to see that they're not part of a list of people who are registered funding portals. And so it's just a matter of how much damage can they do, if any, well, hopefully minimal until it's stopped. Um, you know, I think, but yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take, you know, in terms of accreditation, it's going to have to be, you know, I think there should be a due diligence requirement of it, what kind of what Lauren was saying and what you were hoping to do. Um, but at the same time, we realize that, you know, these are relatively not enormous amounts of money isn't going to be raised over here and not overburdening. And this is, again, something we struggled with in writing the thing. You know, we're not, you know, creating the next massive, we're not creating Edward Jones or Charles Schwab here. You know, so trying to find the right balance where some due diligence is done, but at the same time, um, making sure that this is right sized at the types of I, I think that that should not be lost over the next year. It is finite amounts of money that are being raised, and by legislation, implicit in the legislation, there's an acceptance that some of this money, most of this money, will not end up resulting in viable businesses being created. And that's okay as long as there's not fraud. The portal question is a very compelling question because I think the CAPS program the accreditation of, and the standardization of portals and how they operate is critical to creating the self-policing that Sean was talking about so that when and if there is lost money, we'll all be able to say in good conscience we were doing a good job and this just happened. The concern that portals will be created that are not authorized or licensed by FINRA or the SEC I think is important. There will be a registration of some kind. I think there should be whistleblowing. Maybe we should explore the possibility of separate URLs. So it's .prtl, so people are alerted straight away. Uh, because I think that is the risk. But again, because I guess I'm here to impress upon folks that there have been problems historically. There are people who sell unregistered securities every day in this country that are not registered broker deals. I'm not condoning it. Don't quote me incorrectly. I am just saying it does happen. Bad people are more clever than any of us in this room. They will do bad things, and we have to be out there educating the world to be aware of it, avoid it, and invest responsibly. Can I, can I ask one more thing? Um, just on my first example, um, I think that there's a, a reputational factor with a lot of these portals. Um, so as you might guess, I'm never buying a purse online again, but if I were to, um, I don't know if I would go to purse.com. And there is something about eBay that really, it does have your reputation, a reputation, I might buy other things on eBay again, just so you know. Um, but, but there is a reputation, I know that they have a process, I felt great going through that whole process, and I think that will really, those um, portals will hopefully rise to the, yeah. to the top um, of the pile. I think it would be great also, just to, to pick up on the whistleblower thing, is if there's a process where if you see a pop-up portal, you're able to tell the authorities instantly. And maybe that's something, David, who could, uh, that uh, the organization could, uh, could foster. Uh, I think we've got time for a few questions, and the first one was over here. Well, mine's not really a question. I more had like a comment on how I thought you could protect or ensure that portals were uh, accurate. By what you were saying about having videos, I know what you're talking about with this Bulgarian company where you could post um, a bunch of ideas really quickly, but I find it hard to believe that you could find enough people to record fake videos for you to uh, receive money for these donations, I mean, and for these get investments. And like they were saying earlier about Indiegogo, finding that once you reach 33%, then the rest of the crowd gets involved. I find it hard that these companies will get enough people interested initially if they're not real, because that's where all their initial support will come from, is from having their friends and family donate to it, and then the rest of the crowd gets involved. So to, I think that it is a re legitimate threat, but I don't think that portals will be successful enough with not having real videos and having the initial support from fam friends and family to get these ideas started on their sites. It's a good point. I mean, it's, uh, there's a sort of market discipline involved in, in the elements that you're talking about, which is useful. 
Yes, um, if an intermediary organization, let's say, provides education only, information <coughs> only, uh, because you had mentioned, uh, well, the question is, do they, do they also have to register with the SEC? Uh, okay. it, it's, um, you had mentioned funding portal specifically. But if a portal, if, well, get away from the word portal for a second. If a website provides information only, does it still have to register? We're, we're certainly hoping that the SEC will clarify that people who provide information only and analysis along the lines of the crowd check uh, will not need to register as a portal. There's, there's quite a few people in that space doing various uh, very useful amalgamation, analysis in some cases. Uh, it would be uh, devastating if those were treated as being portals. I, by the definitions in the, uh, the statute, I don't think so. Um, and I mean, the key is, is money, money, isn't it? The money is going through the portals, like right. uh, early shows. It's not going, this is purely information. Uh, uh, Maurice? Um, um, <coughs> we talk about the vetting, we talk a lot about vetting processes. We're very vetting here. You know, we're looking, trying to select the cream of the crop of the companies to crowdfund. So my question to you was, where, where is vetting blurred a line between investment opinion? Because I know that there, there's quite a bit of, you know, Doug was mentioning that earlier, that, you know, it's like, well, you've got to be careful. If you vet too much, then they can say you, you, you're, you're providing an investment opinion. But if, you're, but if you're basically providing a checklist that is a 101 checklist like uh, you know, Mercedes-Benz or whatever, you know, that the car is not all the 101 checklist, then therefore it'll be approved, then you're kind of, you know, are you really providing an investment opinion? On it? And, and why shouldn't we be vetting these companies out? Isn't that the whole point of avoiding this fraud? I mean, I think, so I'll tell you what our intent was in preparing this. Um, and, you know, Senator Bennett actually did a statement for the record on this. We firmly believe due diligence vetting is not investment advice. It's not recommendations. Um, I think, you know, and this is, I don't want to say you know it when you see it, because there, you're right, there is a fine line there. Um, and that's something we're going to work with the SEC to make sure that that line, that <coughs> it, it is a service to investors um, to, have, to make sure that the, the company does exist. I think when we were preparing it, we just thought if you, you start crossing the line where, where you know, it becomes something closer to an advertisement about a company rather than saying this company exists and these people exist and this is what this company has, you know, has done so far. Um, or if it's a new idea, here's information about the idea and this person exists. <coughs> you know, so it, but you're right, it, 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 you know, we left flexibility and I know everybody kind of cringes, but again, you know, in writing this in Congress, the line is, is blurry, you're right. And I think we're going to make have to make sure that the regulators get it right in the, in, before we cross the line between due diligence and investment advice. So it's going to be tricky, though, I agree. Yeah, I, I think Senator Bennett's uh, comments were quite clear along the lines of you sort them, you curate them, you yeah. filter them, and that's not investment advice. So we assume the SEC for the same, right? Just a couple of questions about uh, the funding portal itself. <coughs> That's an area of particular interest to me. I've been, I've worked for broker dealers and I've been a principal in investment management companies, an investment advisory firms. So um, I know that register, I think we're still thinking in terms of registration is not approval, registration is registration. But the SEC is not, um, is, is uh, validating the existence of the group. It's not making a judgment about whether the group is good or bad or indifferent. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so it sounds like that might be something that a self-regulatory organization may take on as an additional standard. Do you think that that's likely, or, or how do you, uh, I guess, what uh, could you describe the best, uh, sort of the ideal funding portal? We're right here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, feel free anyone else to take it. I mean, I, you know, to me, the ideal funding portal <coughs> is something that is user friendly, is digestible, it, it has disclosures and information that a retail investor can understand and it doesn't have things, I mean, obviously there's gonna be boilerplate crammed in in places, but, uh, and I would say actually that there's some degree of similarities between funding portals 
in terms of the types of disclosures you're getting or the types of information you're getting about particular companies. So I wouldn't even say my ideal funding <coughs> would be X. I think in my ideal world that you know it, it would be things would become standardized, I guess, um, and that things would be relatable. Again, focusing on you know a person who's trying to help their college roommate's company start up, not necessarily someone who's running a venture fund. So, I, you know, I think that's, but you're right, you know, having, you know, again, you know, what Sarah was saying, you know, we envision, you know, the funding portals allowing to curate, to sort. Um, if you're interested in, you know, in biomedical companies in Boulder, Colorado, you know, you should be able to, you know, sort for biomedical companies in Colorado or something like that. So something that has a user friendliness that actually truly does educate the investor and makes it clear that this is not, this isn't, you know, this isn't a donation, that, you know, you could lose it all and making it very clear to people that it's your entire investment. Um, I think that would be, and again, just this, you know, I would say this is Senator Bennett's official views, but just thinking out loud, that would be my my ideal world of how crowdfunding would exist. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question at the back. I know I'm missing people. Brian's pointing. John Brown. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm sure uh, most of uh, panel members probably understand this, but due diligence is an expensive endeavor. And, and when you add to that the fact that the early stage development of a company, which typically had a restricted fund to begin with, has there been any thought given to how, uh, what sort of trajectory this might take place? To make it affordable for you know the, uh, the issuer, uh, we, you know, will, can a service provider provide this due diligence or the fact, fact checking of how they could be recompensed? Has there been any thought given? You know, well, you, you've just described our business model, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you for doing that. Uh, I mean, that's really where we're coming from. Uh, CrowdCheck, we think, fills a need to do micro due diligence in these micro IPOs. Um, it's too expensive to do the type of stuff I used to do for, for New York Stock Exchange listed companies where we're talking about multi-million dollar offerings. <coughs> but if we can take that model and those thoughts and those concepts, scale them down so we can answer the question, if I were investing my money in this company, or if I were investing my grandmother's money in this, in this company, what would I want to know? What information would I need in order to make an informed investment decision? And that's really what we're here for. Uh, and and uh, in a very self-serving way, I will just end it on that note. <laughs> 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 and thank you very much.